The Outlaw Lawyers, Josh Whitaker and Joe Hamer, managing partners at Whitaker & Hamer Law Firm, offices in Raleigh, Garner, Clayton, Goldsboro, Fuquay, Verena, and Gastonia. I'm Morgan Patrick, consumer advocate. We talk legalese every single week. And folks, there's going to be an opportunity. If you've got a legal situation you're going through and you've got your own set of questions, you can call this number 800-659-1186. That's 800-659-1186. Leave your contact information briefly, what the call's about, and an attorney with Whitaker and Hamer will be in touch. And you can always email your questions to this program. We'll answer them on the air, future programs, obviously. Questions at theoutlawlawyer.com. Gentlemen, what's up next? All right, Morgan, we've got a big U.S. Supreme Court case has been in the news quite a bit uh, everywhere. Everywhere I look, ESPN, because there's a sports angle, was reporting on it the other day. Uh, but everywhere I look, everything I read, Kennedy v. Bremerton School District had oral arguments in front of the Supreme Court. And this is the one where the coach, uh, I think Joe Kennedy, Joseph Kennedy is his name, um, praying after games. Uh and then we'll talk about it because this is, this is a weird case because usually when things get to the Supreme Court, they've been litigated ad nauseum. And when it gets to the Supreme Court, there's a, a factual record. Everybody has finally agreed on kind of what happened. A lot of times at the trial court, the first level, you know, the plaintiff has their version of the facts. The defendant's like, no, that's not what happened. This is what happened. And you, that gets litigated and appealed. And so when, when you get to the Supreme Court, everybody's agreed on some version of the facts. And so the Supreme court is just answering que legal questions, questions about the law. What tests do we apply here? Is this protected under the constitution? Did someone act uh, unconstitutional? You know, so they're looking at legal things. And so this case, I don't know that both sides agree on the facts. That was the biggest takeaway for me is uh, the Supreme court's kind of having, having to decide what actually uh, happened here, but it seems like the majority of um it seems like what what happened is we've got a, a high school coach, and after games, win or lose, he would go uh, kind of maybe to the fifty yard line out on the field. Uh, he would get down on one knee and he'd pray out loud for ten or ten or fifteen seconds, just a quick, you know, glory all glory goes to God kind of thing. And this was real important to him. And apparently, he had been doing it for years and years and years. Uh, Joe, uh, I know I did not play high school football. Uh, Joe, you did play high school football, right? I, I did play high school football several, several years of it, several glorious years of it. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and, and, you know, I played high school football at Clayton high school for the, the, uh, I would say local legend of a coach, uh, Gary Fowler, very old school, very old school guy, very old school coach, um, in Johnston County. Uh, so you can imagine we 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 would we absolutely we would pray before every single game and after every single game, and uh, we actually had like a chap a team chaplain that would uh, would do that for us. But that was a big part of it, you know. That was a big part of it, and um, you know, it was never made a huge issue. It was not something that that was made a big deal. It was not something that was really forced upon people. But uh, you know, everyone participated for the most part. Like nobody was walking away or ignoring it. Like I, I'm sure some, ki not every kid on the team was religious, but they would just kind of, they'd still take a knee, they'd still sit there, they'd be respectful. Um, but uh, it was just something you, you didn't really think about it, man. It was just something you did, you know. And uh, yeah, it was a big so, part of what we did. So tons of Supreme Court cases, you know, uh, and you you get into the free exercise clause clause in the First Amendment, the establishment clause of the First Amendment. There's a lot of constitutional uh, things at, at play in this case, and both sides, I uh, think they're right, right? This guy's like, hey, this I'm not in my official duties after the game. It's just something I wanted to do. Um, so he's like, my, my free exercise of religion should be protected because I'm not in my official duties. The game's over. And, um, and he's, you know, and, and then the school's like, oh, you can't do this on, you, you are here on school grounds. You are in your official capacity. We can't establish, you know, we're a government institution. We can't establish a religion. So both sides think they're 100% right, citing, citing kind of the same amendment. So it, it's, it's, a, it's a very interesting case, you know. In, and, in and you know, it, looking at that argument, you know, there's it, it, taking out the argument of whether or not the, the coach should be allowed to, to do a, a voluntary prayer with the players who, who elect to do it with him. You know, the argument that 
the game is over, so you're not in your official capacity as a coach anymore. Doesn't I mean that doesn't really fly for me because you know the game a game can be over, but uh, you're still the coach, you know, and you're still you're going to the locker room. You're still uh, you have especially if it's like an away game, you still have custody of the players. You're busting them back to the school. Um, so you know I don't know that the the that the argument that, well, the game is over, so I'm not in that, that capacity anymore really flies again. And that's, that's completely ignoring the issue of whether or not, you know, this should be something that's allowed to happen. So, and I guess this is, this is something he's done for a while. I, I don't remember how many years, but this is something that's been going on for a while. And, uh, you know, he go to the middle field after every game, take a knee, and then some of his players would come out some players from the other team would come out. So it just got bigger, bigger, bigger. And then some coach from another team complained to the administration. It was like, Oh, we didn't know this was really happening, which I don't see how that's the case. But, um, and then they, they told him to stop. And he's like, you know, I'm not going to stop. And he lost his job. And this happened eight years ago. Right. So we're just getting to the Supreme court. Um, he's been, you know, he hadn't had his job for a long time. That's a long time too, man. Eight years, you know, you, you got to think the landscape has really changed in a lot of ways in that period of time as well. But it brings up, yeah, it, it does. And it, it brings up a lot of interesting questions. Like this prayer in school has been litigated for, you know, a hundred years. You know, what what can you do in school? What can't you do in school? And 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 depending on what side you fall on, right, people feel very strongly, right? If you think, you know, I don't want my I don't want my kid in public school praying or getting any, you know, kind of thought that one religion's preferred over the other, and then you got, you know, you know, Christian parents or, or whatever, like, Hey, my kids should be able to pray in school if they don't want to, your kids don't have to participate. And and so you got these two sides that kind of butt heads and this stuff gets litigated all the time. Um, but it's interesting here because we have, and again, I think the fact this is, you know, fact specific, we really need to know what happened. Like you said, um, we're trying to determine what's part of your official duty as a, as a employee, a government employee, a school employee, and what can you do and can't do. And so that you can see the justices in the oral arguments, I kind of read the transcript and they're, they're peppering everybody with these fact patterns. Okay. Well, if we say this is wrong, what about this? You know, what if you, uh, during school text your spouse, you know, a, a little prayer or something, everybody's okay with that. And then they just keep elevating. Well, what if your spouse comes by school and you, you pray in certain spots. And so it's, it seems almost silly to a certain point, but when you have these constitutional rights, you know, butting up against each other, the facts are, are very important. And so we don't have any evidence that any kid felt left out or, you know, felt that the school was establishing a religion. So we don't have any, anything like that. It's just that the, it's just the sheer fact this happened. That's what, that's what triggered everything. Um, but it, it, it's very interesting. If nothing else, it's interesting. It's, it is, it's very interesting. And like you said, that one of the most interesting aspects of it is the, is the idea that the facts are not, you know, fully agreed upon and settled at this point. You know, like you said, most of the time something gets to the Supreme court facts are, are ironclad, man, set in stone. There's no dispute. And, and it's just a question of law, but, uh, the fact that there's still some factual, some factual questions, uh, it's, it's of interest. And, you know, I think it, it makes it, it almost makes it likely that you're going to see this kind of kick back for some, some clarification on those facts prior to making a ruling on the law. Well, you know, the Supreme court justices couldn't even decide what kind of case this is. They're like, all right, is this a free speech case? If so, we apply this test. Is this is an establishment clause case. We apply this test. Is this an just an employment discrimination case? Because then we need to send it somewhere else, you know. So they were struggling to figure out what are we dealing with, you know what what is this? But I think that's what's going to happen. I think this one, the 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 attorneys were arguing very hard for the Supreme Court not to to send it back to the trial court level to to figure things out. Like, look, it's here. Let's you know, it's taking this long. Let's it's just been let's eight just rule years. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, but there's a, there's a good website out there. If you ever want to learn more about some of the things that we brought up, there's a Supreme Court of the United States blog. It's a SCOTUS blog. And they do a good job of following a lot of these. And that's where you can get a lot of oral arguments and kind of find out what's happening. A lot of times the news will just summarize like, hey, this happened. And, and maybe this is what it means going forward. But I like to see how these things uh, kind of come, come together and, and seeing the justices in action, you know, seeing what questions they ask and what they're concerned with is, is always adds a little bit more to it, but that man, they were all over the place. There's no, 
there was no Supreme Court unity on this one. They can't even can't even decide what kind of case it is. So it'll yeah, that's it'll, the thing, man. What what test do they apply? That's going to be that's the real question. And uh, I, I think with all this uncertainty, man, not even under not even fully knowing what type of case this is, what standard is applied, how it's approached. I'm going to I'm going to neglect to make a, a prediction on this one. I, I think it's unsafe for our sterling 100 percent <laughs> record to make a prediction. Right. Yeah, we can't we can't risk that too much. Too much at risk. The Outlaw Lawyers, Josh Whitaker and Joe Hamer. You can find them again at Whitaker and Hamer Law Firm. They're the managing partners. They're also practicing attorneys here in the great state of North Carolina. Offices conveniently located Raleigh, Garner, Clayton, Goldsboro, Fuquay, Verena, and Gastonia. If you have a legal situation, you've got questions, listen to this phone number, jot it down, and call at 800-659-1186. That's 800-659-1186. Leave your contact information, briefly what the call is about. An attorney with Whitaker and Hamer will be in touch. And you can always email your questions to this program. We'll answer it on future programs, questions at theoutlawlawyer.com. We're back right after this.